Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Virtual Mosey. My name is Jose, and today we're going to continue our space topic for our wonderful field trip Friday, and we're actually going to head through these doors to the Saunders Planetarium. Now, before we actually dive into that, I just want to remind everyone that if you have any questions or comments, please type them in down below. We'll be reading through those comments and then answering those questions uh, throughout the presentation. So without further ado, let's go ahead and check it out. So this is the front door to the Saunders Planetarium, obviously. And as we're walking in, you'll find that to our right-hand side, we've got some telescopes that are set up. And you might also notice that immediately it gets considerably darker. That's actually on purpose. That's so that your eyes can start to adjust to the darkness because believe it or not, it will be nearly pitch black in the Saunders Planetarium in order for us to accurately reproduce the night sky. So we've got some telescopes set up here. Uh, the large ones, these actually come out during our sky watch events. So once all of this is over, we'll go ahead and pick uh, back up with our Skywatch events. The smaller ones here, we take these two schools for our Telescopes to Go programs. So if you're a teacher and you're tuning in, be sure to uh, send us an email, kind of get more information about how you can help bring telescopes to your school once, you know, everything's been uh, worked out. But yeah, this is the entrance to the Saunders Planetarium, and we've got some nice kind of uh, models here. We've got some rockets, we've got the space shuttle rocket, the orbiter, as you can see. We've got some of the SLS mock-ups as well. And we've even got a pretty, uh, pretty moon globe here on the top of the cabinet. And these are just some things that you can uh, walk by. And some of you might have walked past them and never really noticed that they were there. Um, because you're trying to get to the show, trying to make sure that you arrive on time. Otherwise, the show starts without you and you can't get back in. So let's go ahead and continue down this hallway here, and you'll find that there are lovely posters filled with information on both asteroids, planets, and all sorts of things. Uh, and all of this is, again, kind of a nice, smooth entry into what is the Saunders Planetarium itself. So right now, it's just kind of the tip of the iceberg. We haven't even dipped our toes in the water, and already there's some cool images, some great graphics, and a lot of really neat information about space all around you. So it really helps bring you into this uh, world uh, that's out of this world, if you will. And here to my uh, right, or technically you guys' left, is the big boy. So this is our largest telescope here at the museum. It is a 20-inch primary mirror F5, it's, a, it's called an obsession telescope, and as you can see, it's much taller than I am, and in order to look through this telescope, you actually do need a stepladder, because your eye would have to look through this hole up here. So this is the biggest telescope, and I know that some of you might have questions such as, hey, I'm interested in a telescope, which one's the best telescope? Most of the time, people will say, well, the biggest one you can afford, the bigger the telescope, the better the... Uh, objects you'll be able to see, the fainter objects will be easier to pick up. However, there is such a thing as having a telescope that's too big. This really big telescope is also kind of cumbersome, so really the answer to which is the best telescope is the one you use most often. So don't feel bad if your telescope's kind of small. That usually means you're able to take it places and uh, look at more objects than hauling around a really, really big telescope. And then we are right against the corner here. This is actually the main entrance to the planetarium itself. And as you can see, the lights are now exclusively red in color. That's actually to help continue adjusting your eyes to the darkness. This is the same reason why a lot of uh, camping headlamps and even astronomers, they had used red lights in order to help preserve their night vision and still be able to see objects in the dark. You'll see I have one final telescope behind us here, kind of giving us a final introduction into this world of space. And let's go ahead and head on in. Huh. As you can see, these doors are locked. And that's because, again, it's going to be very dark in the planetarium, and it takes time for your eyes to adjust. So the presenter will actually open up these doors. Hopefully they know I'm here. And once those doors are open, we'll be able to head on in. 
Hello? Oh, hello, oh, Maxwell. Hey. Let's head on in. Hey, welcome, everybody. Come on inside. All right.
writing music. Uh, but this is Kronos. Now, Kronos is actually Mosey's very own half a million dollar opto mechanical star projection system, which is a little bit of a mouthful, so that's probably the only time you'll hear me say that. Uh, aside from that, we'll just call it Kronos. And you'll notice it has all of these small protrusions all over the sides. And really, you can think of those kind of like the small tube constellation activities that we performed yesterday, except they're all over. And rather than doing that to just a handful of stars, Kronos can project upwards of 8,500 stars. Now, the machine here is what we call optomechanical, which means that there's really actual lamps that are passing light in front of lenses that have little, uh, a film with little pinpoints so that the light can actually shine through and everything is controlled mechanically. It's not a digital projector. It's actually what we would call old school, but trust me, this is some pretty advanced technology because Kronos has the ability to accurately show us the night sky as it would appear from anywhere on planet Earth at any point in time. So Kronos is really, really cool, and again, my all-time favorite machine to ever work with. Now, actually, what are a couple of other things that we can do with Kronos that we would normally do in a regular show? Well, Kronos itself can give you some pretty full notes for the night sky, and also realistic views of the skies appears for that okay. Slowly dim down the lights. We have a couple of steps for about 8 30 tonight. So let's see what that should look up. Normally, as the sun sets, you have bright objects at first appear. Then we things like your non stellar objects, things like the moon, the first natural natural satellite, and as well as a few planets as well. In fact, one you might have been catching, very few less. site 
stellarium-web.org, and it brings up the night sky. And with it, you're able to control what you see. Now, it should be a little bit better now. Uh, you should be able to see that it's displaying the sun overhead, as well as Mercury, Neptune, Uranus, Venus, and we saw Venus all the way in the west earlier because that's when we would expect to see it around 8 p.m. tonight. So Venus being over here in the east actually tells us that right now we are observing the current time. So why is it that we can see all these things? Well, because right now we've got the atmosphere disabled. Mr. Maxwell, let's go ahead and turn on the Earth's atmosphere once again. Oh, that's quite the difference. So as you can tell, now that the atmosphere is back on, this is the current view of the Tampa Bay skyline in the current time. So this is actually today uh, at 1.36 in the evening. So it's definitely oh, 46. Uh, so it's definitely pretty cool. Now let's go ahead and showcase what should be visible tonight. So now that we can show our audience members some of the objects which are visible in the nighttime sky, we're just going to dial in today's date and we're going to set it to 8. Of the east, southeast, and actually, what are these three planets? 
planets of Jupiter, Saturn, and the red planet Mars. Excellent. So Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars. And Max, if I wanted to see something cool like planet Jupiter, do I need a telescope? Actually, no. All of the major planets of the solar system, there are actually five that you can see with the naked eye. These would be Mercury, which you'll see early in the morning, just a little bit before sunrise, popping up. And your first ones you'll notice that I will be actually Jupiter itself, large planet of the solar system, followed by Saturn, second biggest but just as important, and our red planet from Mars, the most noticeable of your visible planets due to its eerie red hue. Excellent. And then if I just had a set of binoculars, I could actually point them to something like planet Jupiter, and if they're pretty decent binoculars, you can actually observe what early astronomers such as Galileo observed in the year 1608 when he first pointed his telescope to Jupiter. You can see not just one big dot, that's planet Jupiter, you'll also find four small little dots around it, which are the largest of its 79 satellites. So here we have the moons Callisto, Ganymede, Io, and Europa, which is kind of behind Jupiter as we speak. Uh, but those are the four largest of Jupiter's 79 moons. Uh, the further we zoom in with our Stellarium program, the more moons that you will be able to observe. But if you've just got a decent pair of binoculars, you'll see them as four little dots. And the more you observe, the more you realize that they actually change position around the planets. And again, that's something that the astronomer Galileo observed through his telescope uh, well over 400 years ago. So that's definitely really, really cool. And spoiler alert, this is my all-time favorite planet to observe precisely for that reason. So Jupiter is my favorite king of the planets, if you will. Now let's go ahead and kind of zoom back out. And I think everyone's favorite planet just so happens to be Saturn. That's all cool because Saturn is absolutely breathtaking through a telescope. While you can use a pair of binoculars, unfortunately, you're not going to be able to resolve Saturn's most prominent and famous feature, which is its ring system. Now, as you can see, Saturn's got quite an assortment of moons as well. It has confirmed 83 moons that orbit around it, meaning that. Uh, It's all really cool. Uh, the ring system is thought to be made up of dust and ice particles, and it could also have just been an early moon that unfortunately wandered too close to the planet and got torn apart by its gravity. So there is some beauty in destruction, as is seen here by the rings of Saturn. There we go. Very, very nice view of Saturn. Beautiful. Saturn's largest moon is Titan, and it's got lakes of liquid methane. Uh, so that's actually of importance to many scientific missions. Uh, in the future, we might even end up visiting Titan with some robots. Uh, we don't really have very clear views of the surface in Solarium, uh, but the last time we orbited around Saturn was quite some time ago. Now let's go ahead and kind of get a nice wide view of all of what is visible. Let's turn on the constellation lines and let's go ahead and slowly uh, boost some light as we read through any comments. So I hope you guys have enjoyed this kind of behind the scenes look at the Saunders Planetarium. I hope you guys have enjoyed everything that we've been trying to show you guys. And remember, in order to really appreciate Kronos and everything it can do, uh, you really do have to experience it in person. It's just due to the nature of the system. Uh, it's going to look absolutely stunning because the stars themselves are very bright against the inky black backdrop of space. Uh, so it's going to be absolutely stunning in person. Definitely check it out once, you know, everything is over. <laughs> um, 
But I hope you guys have enjoyed. Uh, let's see if we have any questions down below. Any? We have some questions? Yeah. Oh, all right. I love questions. Let's go ahead. Um, so one is asking, can Chrono show constellations from the Southern Hemisphere? Yes. The question was, can Chrono show constellations from the Southern Hemisphere? The answer is yes. Chronos has uh, the ability to reproduce all 88 constellations, although not all at the same time. Right now, we've only got, I want to say, about 16 or so uh, that we use on a daily basis. Uh, but in the Southern Hemisphere, we've got the constellation Cross, the Southern Cross, uh, which I know a lot of guests want to see the Southern Cross from Florida. Unfortunately, the Southern Cross is called that for a reason, right? So you have to be in the Southern Hemisphere to get some really nice views of it, or at least closer to the Southern Hemisphere. So if you're closer to the equator, you can get some glimpses of it. But from somewhere like Tampa, the Southern Cross is much too uh, low beneath the horizon, so you can't actually see it. But yeah, Chronos can show us some Southern constellations. Uh, excellent question, by the way. Yeah. And. Without further ado, I just want to say thank you guys for joining us with another episode of Virtual Mosey. Uh, this has been our Space Week. If you have more questions, uh, leave them in the comments down below. By the way, the Nebula Art, I believe that's been named the Heart Nebula. Oh. All right, guys, so thank you so much for joining us in this episode. We will catch you guys next time. Stay safe, stay curious, and keep discovering. Bye-bye.